is uh, I have a colleague who is a retired psychologist and saw a version of this talk some months ago. And he told me that uh, because the nature of the subject matter is uh, it's it's rather sad. He said that uh, it would probably be good for us to give everyone an antidepressant before we begin. Uh, that's uh, it's really not an exaggeration. So um, let's see if we can uh, get started here. We're going to be focusing our attention on aerial insectivores. And if you don't know what those are, those are all the birds that capture their insect prey in flight. So that includes all six of Wisconsin swallows, the chimney swift, our night jars, which include Eastern whippoorwill and common nighthawk. Uh, it also includes a group of forest flycatchers. And if you really stretch it, it could even include birds like uh, red-headed woodpecker, which in the summer acts as an aerial insectivore. It doesn't forage on the bark of trees like most woodpeckers in the breeding season. It sits on a branch and flies out and captures insects just like uh, flycatchers do. So here are our photos of uh, our group of Aerial insectivores in Wisconsin, the upper left-hand corner is chimney swift. In the center on the top row is common nighthawk. Far right on the top row is great crested flycatcher. The second row from the left is rough wing swallow, whippoorwill, bank swallow. And then on that lower row from the left, barn swallow, purple martin, which is our largest swallow, and then cliff swallow on the right. Hey, Bill, before you move on, um, I think your your slides are still partial screen and not full screen. Okay. Um, as to how to, oh, I think maybe from current slide on that top left, try that. Okay. That better? Ah, beautiful. Except it bumped you back, but there you go. Oh, that's okay. That looks great. Okay, so as most of you know, when ecologists talk about habitat, they talk about terrestrial habitat, like grassland, forest, marshes, things like that. And then aquatic habitat, lakes and rivers and streams. Uh, but one thing that ecologists have recently begun to look at is the concept of airspace as habitat. In all the past 150 years of ecology, it's kind of curious that we've never done that, but we're definitely doing it now. So think of all the airspace above the land and water as habitat for a group of aerial um, fauna. So that could include insects that are flying around. Uh, it could include bats, but it certainly includes this group of uh, aerial insectivorous birds. We'll consider several concepts and sets of facts. Among them, we know that aerial insectivores, broadly speaking, are declining. They exhibit specialized behaviors our studies and those of others describe kind of emerging information. Remember, we're talking about populations, not individual birds at a local scale. So if someone often says to me somewhere through this talk, uh, well, how can barn swallows be declining? I saw one just the other day. So that's the individual bird at the local scale. We're talking about the broad scale, all of the individuals in the entire population together. So aerial insectivores as a group have lost 
160 million individuals since 1970 for a total population loss of minus 32%. In other words, two in five of all the barn swallows in North America have been lost. And that's just one example. Real losses have occurred. This group has lost a huge portion of its population. Some declines are shocking in extent, as I will reveal to you in the coming slides. So these species belong to different avian orders and families. Uh, we just listed those for you. How do we know this? Here are some trends from the Federal Breeding Bird Survey, not the Breeding Bird Atlas, but we'll fold that in as we go. The graph show results and trends since 1966 up to today. So here's common nighthawk. Uh, you have to get used to all of these graphs that show decline. You know, the, the central line there with the open circles, that's uh, results by year from the late 1960s to today. And all of these uh, graphs, with some exceptions, look like a playground slide, and they're all going in the wrong direction. So here's the results from Atlas One that was done back in the late 1990s. Uh, the confirmed locations are in dark blue. The probable locations are in light blue. Uh, it shows a kind of scattered pattern of uh, occurrence for this species. Nighthawk is not a very easy species to confirm. Uh, sure, you can see one, but that doesn't mean that you can confirm that it's nesting there. The Atlas II map is even uh, more sparse than this. So here's Eastern Whippoorwill. Uh, it's got a similar downward trending uh, trend line. This is what's called a change map resulting from uh, the recent second breeding bird atlas. So if you look at all the blocks displayed on this map, the ones that are in red were whippoorwills were found during Atlas One. The ones that are in green are where this species was found during Atlas Two, and the ones in I guess it shows as dark blue on your screen where the species was found in both atlases. So if if you look at the large blocks of red on this map, you can see that considerable areas of the state of Wisconsin have no longer have whippoorwill populations. So this, this is a re fairly recent scientific paper showing where whippoorwills from, I guess it's six different areas, Illinois, Missouri, Ohio, Wisconsin. And uh, so it shows where all of those whippoorwills from those various states, it shows where they spend the winter. And interestingly, you can see that it's a fairly small geographic region in Central America where all those birds are in the winter, starting in Southern Mexico and extending through Honduras, Costa Rica to some extent, and into uh, Guatemala. So fairly small geographic area where all of the whippoorwills seem to be wintering. That's worrisome because uh, any kind of habitat destruction that takes place there can really severely impact that species during its winter season. Some research on the forest night jars is showing that it may not be just declines of insects in general, but declines of certain groups of species of large moths. Now, a large moth uh, 
you know, if you've ever seen a cecropia moth, that's the ideal prey for whippoorwills and birds like that. Uh, Felina English, she's a researcher from British Columbia. She refers to this as changes in abundance of higher trophic level prey, the preferred prey of the whippoorwill. So here's chimney swift graphs. The graph on the left shows a really large area, what's called the Eastern Breeding Bird Survey area. So let's say everything east of the Mississippi River and the uh, graph on the right shows Wisconsin. So chimney swift has declined in Wisconsin, but not as strongly as some of these other species of area of insectivores. Purple Martin, uh, Recent research shows that purple martins do not shift their arrival times in the spring to correspond to higher temperatures on the breeding grounds here in North America. So they are therefore one of the species possibly experiencing what's called a climate mismatch, where we have warm springs, insects hatch out early, and then when purple martins get here, Sometimes some of their preferred insect prey has already gone through the big hatch. So it's going to take us a while to learn if that's actually what's happening here. So here's another change map. This is for Purple Martin. This has even larger areas of the state. Uh, what, you, what you really need to be concerned with here is the areas of green where purple martins were confirmed during Atlas II, the period between 2015 and 2020. So there's really large areas of the state, the whole northern tier of counties, the whole driftless area in southwestern Wisconsin, which seem to have no colonies of purple martins any longer. So here are some amazing reasons behind what's happening. Uh, purple martins spend the winter in the Amazon basin. And a couple of things are happening there that may have long-term damaging effect on purple martins. So small scale artisanal gold mining occurs along small streams connected to the Amazon. And those people use mercury to cause gold to precipitate out. In addition, hydroelectric dams can also give off mercury. And mercury is taken up in the bodies of insects, which are in turn eaten by purple martins. So many purple martins have a contaminant load of mercury that they bring with them back to North America. Now, in some cases, mercury doesn't outright kill the birds, but it may weaken them. It may cause them to have difficulty during migration, and it may affect their long-term prospects for breeding. So that's a, a serious concern. It's gonna be quite complicated to turn that around. So another one of our species, probably the one that I'm most concerned about, the bank swallow. If, if you've done a lot of birding in uh, Milwaukee County, you may have seen bank swallows here and there. We used to have and may still have in some years, a fairly large bank swallow colony on the bluff in Warnemont Park. I recommend you go there and look for that. So bank swallow, has really declined probably more than any of these other species, an estimated 89% since the 1970s. But across Canada, from British Columbia to Nova Scotia, the breeding population has shown the largest declines with an estimated 98% loss during the period of the 1970s into the early 2010s. Bank swallow is designated as a threatened species. A bank swallow, you have to realize, is another one of these really ubiquitous birds. It, it uh, breeds on every continent 
except Antarctica. And in the old world, it's known as, uh, let's see, what's the name of it again? The, the sand martin, but it's the same species. Worldwide declines in insect populations are undoubtedly implicated in this, but uh, we have much yet to learn about that. So here's bank swallow numbers. You can see these really distressing trend lines for both the, the breeding bird survey region in the east and that right-hand graph again for that same time period in the state of Wisconsin. So here's a change map for bank swallow. It's a little more up-to-date version here. You can see uh, during Atlas One, those are the blocks that are marked in orange. The marked ones in blue are from the second Atlas. That was the, the recent one from 2015 to 2020. And the dark gray blocks show uh, when species was present in both atlases. So again, you can see considerable areas of the state where the species certainly is present, but no longer as widespread and abundant as it used to be. And believe me, this used to be a very abundant bird. So here are maybe the, the swallow that people know the best, the barn swallow, another worldwide species. Barn swallow results for the Eastern Breeding Bird Survey region on the left, uh, for Alberta in the upper right, and for Ontario in the lower right. So very, very strong declines for that species all across Canada and the US. So if you look at, if you're familiar with eBird, uh, you may see some of the tools that they use that data for. Uh, there's a, a tab on the eBird website that's called Science. And you look there for a, a, a set of tools called Status and Trends. So look to the right-hand side for the legend of that map. You can see there's a red line that gets darker red on the left and kind of pinkish on the right and uh, the blue line, right? So red on this map indicates declines. And what do you notice as you look from the west to the east all across uh, the United States? Blue shows increase and there's virtually no blue anywhere on this map. There has not appeared to be what uh, we're con one of the things we're concerned about called the change in productivity or breeding season survival of aerial insectivores. This potentially points to maybe the worst effects that we're worried about occurring on the, the wintering grounds, but there's still significant questions about this. So here, I'm going to talk a little bit about chimney swifts because they're a very urban species. Here's a excellent photo of a chimney swift nest on the inside of a chimney uh, with the eggs. This shows where chimney swifts are found in North America. Again, pretty much easternly of the 100th meridian. Uh, it's not a species found in the West, but there's a very similar species in the Western states. The trends in chimney swift numbers over a 20 year period indicate something on the order of a 20 to 29% decline in the overall population. So chimney swifts are still reasonably abundant in Wisconsin. What do they need? Well, they, they eat a wide range of flying insects that they capture by flying high over cities, fields, forests, and wetlands. They prefer nesting in chimneys and other artificial sites 
including air vents, open wells, cisterns, sometimes old outbuildings. Uh, so the, they still occasionally nest in natural cavities. And we're gonna show you a photo of that. So possible reasons for the declines, we think it might be partially fewer uncapped chimneys. Uh, I recommend the next time you're driving around your neighborhood, just take a look at all your neighbor's chimneys and you will undoubtedly notice, especially if you live in an older part of the city, and there actually are chimneys, that the preponderance of those chimneys is, are capped. Uh, people have done that for a variety of different reasons, but uh, suffice it to say that if the chimney's capped, Chimney swifts can't use that chimney for nesting. So I learned a lot from a few individual chimneys in a research project that we undertook back in 2018. Here's a chimney, and if you look at the top of it, you'll see a ceramic flue kind of poking out of the top of the chimney. Now, again, people have constructed chimneys in many different ways. I used to think that these ceramic flues extended quite a distance down into the chimney, but the fact is in many cases, they're only like a foot in length or maybe 18 inches in length, uh, which still permits the swifts to enter that chimney and build their nest down below the flue on the inside walls of the chimney. So those ceramic flues are not necessarily an obstacle to swifts entering what you might call a modernized sort of chimney. This one's not capped though. So here's a colleague of mine, Tom Schultz, found a building that was no longer in use fairly near him in Green Lake County. And you can see from that upper right photo, there are three flues, right? Tom could actually get inside this building and they had a fireplace there and he crawled up inside the fireplace and found the nest of Swiss that was in there. You can see that photo on the, the lower center there. And then he watched it for a while until the young were hatched and fairly clear to being the right timing for them to experiment flying and, uh, Kind of learning how to be chimney swift, but they would come back to the nest for at least a short time. And you can see from his photos what that looks like when those uh, nestlings are getting quite large now. They don't all really fit inside the nest anymore. So why are Tom's observations significant? Because we're, again, we're learning something about how these chimneys, uh, are used by Swift. And he gave us some photographic evidence of some seldom seen behaviors. So where did Swift's nest before there were chimneys? Well, they used large dead or partly dead old snags, sometimes hollowed out by fire or other kinds of potential tree diseases that caused the central part of the trunk to hollow out. Here's a photo from our colleague Ryan Brady in Northern Wisconsin in 2018, next to the largest yellow birch he's ever found. This tree is 40 inches in diameter. The top of it is broken off and he suspects swifts are nesting in this one. So this is where swifts used to nest and in some cases still do, but there are clearly not as many old big snags as there once were. So what practical things can be done? Research is needed on available roost sites and staging sites, nesting locations and the distribution and structure of chimney types. And last but certainly not least, we need to know so much more about changing insect populations. That as a group is still way behind every other kind of uh, living species that we know about 
we still haven't even named probably 80% of the insect species on Earth. So we need to learn much more about that. Potential solutions. We did a 2018 project in Milwaukee County. Uh, we're still working on the analysis of the, those data. We want to protect access to nesting chimneys that are still in use. And you've probably seen some people are putting up artificial chimney swift towers that are a replacement for chimneys. Uh, I have to tell you though, those are fraught with some difficulty. They don't always work as intended. So if this is something you're interested in, I strongly recommend that you go to the website. The URL is given below of the Wisconsin Chimney Swift Working Group, and you can learn more and get involved there. You can also join my Midwest Aerial Insectivore Discussion Group on Facebook. So it's easy to find, just type that into Facebook. Uh, you can certainly join that group. Uh, I post information and so do other group members approximately every week to 10 days. So you can continue learning more about aerial insectivores there. So uh, I'll take questions now. 